and welcome to the final day of the January Series 2016. My name is Christy Potter, and I'm the director of the January Series. While you are turning off your cell phones... <laughs> Thank you. While you are turning off your cell phones, I'd like to give a special welcome to several of our 48 remote webcast sites across the country. Uh, Ripon, California, Big Rapids, Michigan, Whitensville, Massachusetts, Brampton, Ontario, and Tucson, Arizona. So can you believe it? It's the last day. How quickly the time has flown and what a great month we've had together. So thank you. I know a lot of you came day after day and uh, we're regulars for all 15 days and thanks for, for journeying through the month with us. Um, I hope that it's been a blessing to all. I want to send out a special thanks to our series underwriters, Baker Publishing, and to Doug and Maria DeVos, and to all of our sponsors and our daily underwriters for helping to make the January series a free gift for all. And thanks to all of you who also made individual donations throughout the month through gift envelopes. Uh, those gifts are greatly appreciated, and we could not do this series without the support of our, our, all of our sponsors and, and donors. And now, if you'll pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for a great month of learning, for the opportunity to join together in this place and in locations all across the country and around the world to hear from gifted individuals. We ask now that you will be with our guest, Dr. Mitri Rahab, as he speaks to us. Open our ears and our hearts to hear what you would have us hear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now John Wedfleet, the director of the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship and a professor of music here at Calvin, will introduce our guest. It is a great privilege indeed for all of us to hear today from the prophetic insight of the Reverend Dr. Mitri Rahab, pastor of the Evangelical Lutheran Christmas Church in Bethlehem, Palestine, president of the Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land, founder and president of the Dar al Khalima College, an institution of higher education focused on the visual and performing arts and the cultural heritage of Palestine, author of numerous books, including Faith in the Face of Empire. Later this very week, he will travel to Stockholm to receive the 2015 Olaf Palma Prize for his courageous witness against occupation and violence and for his vision of a future Middle East characterized by peaceful coexistence and equality for all such a poignant and compelling vision. He will be available in the West Lobby of the Covenant Fine Arts Center following the presentation where his books will be for sale. Calvin College is grateful to the ICN Foundation for underwriting today's presentation. Please welcome the Reverend Dr. Mitri Raheb. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure and an honor uh, to be with you uh, today. I have heard a lot about uh, Calvin College and about the January series, and I'm glad to be part of it this year. And thank you for the mild weather. I was expecting like a blizzard or something. Uh, uh, for some of you, this might be uh, the first time uh, to hear uh, a Palestinian, Arab, Christian, and on the top even a Lutheran pastor talking. Uh, and I know it sounds like a contradiction in itself, and many people don't know that we exist. Um, and often people ask us, you know, tell us when did you convert to Christianity? And I like always to remind them to tease them, actually, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Palestine, and not Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Correct? <laughs> and the Bible did not originate in the Bible Belt. <laughs> Thanks, God. I mean, imagine. <laughs> so, so there has been... Uh, a Christian presence in Palestine since the time of Jesus of Nazareth. 
and we understand ourselves to be nothing but the descendant of the first Christian communities that actually evolved around Jesus. And if you come to Christmas Lutheran Church in Bethlehem, you will see that we worship in Arabic. And again, you know, there is always this misperception that many people think Arab equals Muslim. But not all Arabs are Muslims and not all Muslims are Arabs. In fact, Arab Christianity is older than Islam. Uh, I always like to ask people if they know when the gospel was first proclaimed in Arabic. And you know, they think maybe it's from some missionaries from the 19th century from the Midwest or so. <laughs> Believe it or not, if you read Acts chapter two, you remember the story of Pentecost when the disciples started speaking in tongues and they started speaking in Swedish and Norwegian <laughs> and Danish and German, at least this is what Lutherans like to think. I mean, none of these languages is mentioned there, but Arabic is mentioned there. And so for us, it's really important to make sure that the good news will continue to be proclaimed in this ancient language that was already heard in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. And this is why we stay there. Um, but Palestine, where I come from, Bethlehem, is part of the occupied territory. Uh, many people think sometimes that Bethlehem is located in Israel, but actually it's in the occupied territory. So we're still occupied by Israel, and this is one of the longest occupation actually in modern history. Before um, I come to the topic, let me just give you maybe some background so that you will understand the context uh, I, I come from. Uh, I was born in Bethlehem. I know it sounds biblical, but I, you know, I cannot. Uh, uh, as, as a third generation Lutheran. Um, but my family has been Christian since, as I said before, the early centuries. And when I was 13 years old, my father died. And he used to own a, a book and an office supplies uh, store. And with 13, I decided, you know, I'm going to run and manage this store. And actually, this is what I did. So in the morning, I would go to school. My mother will, will be at the store. And in the afternoon, I will come. But I will manage everything. I mean, the finances will go do all the, the, the shopping, etc. And now, I came to realize that actually that experience help prepare me and give me like this entrepreneur uh, spirit that I will share with you a bit more about it. And all the time, at that time, I wanted to become a medical doctor. But when I was in the last school, in the last year in school, I felt the call to ministry. Um, you know, at that time, I'm talking now about like the 70s, late 70s, uh, as young people in the church, our biggest question was the relationship between science and religion. That was the question. And I felt at that time that the pastors around me in our church were really not capable of really giving any answer that made sense to us at least. And so I felt a calling, you know, maybe... Mitri, you should go and study theology uh, and become a pastor. And if you don't like the other pastors around you, so become one. <laughs> and this is what happened. Um, when I decided to study theology, many people from uh, the family didn't like it. They thought, you know, Mitri, you have really good grades. Why do you want to study theology as if, you know, Pastoring is for dummy or something. <laughs> so I got a scholarship and went uh, to study in Germany. And um, I would like today to share with you 
four important stations in my life that shaped very much uh, our ministry in Bethlehem. So I went to Germany to study. I got a scholarship. Um, and um, um, I studied there, spent there seven years. Um, and I returned after the seven years to Bethlehem. I was at that time actually the first person in our church to get a doctorate. Um, and I came back and thought, you know, with a doctorate, now I'm coming back to Palestine with all the answers. You know, especially if you study in German, you think you have all the answers, okay? <laughs> and the church assigned me to Christmas Lutheran Church, which is my home church. I mean, this is where I grew up. This is where I was baptized. I was confirmed. Um, and that wasn't really my favorite place to be. But at that time, the church decided they wanted me there, and they are still paying the price of that decision <laughs> until today. So Christmas Lutheran Church is located downtown Bethlehem. And I came back in May 87, took this small church, um, um, and six months later, the first intifada started. I'm not sure if you remember still the first intifada. I mean, the, the, the students here would not remember that. But uh, that was the time when, you know, the clashes between uh, young Palestinians uh, and Israeli soldiers shooting with live ammunition were on TV all the time. And the thing was that all of these clashes were happening around Christmas Lutheran Church downtown Bethlehem. And I have to say, I mean, even having, you know, a PhD from Germany didn't help me really to, to deal with this situation. I felt I was just not prepared uh, for such a situation. Um, and many of our church elders were put to prison without trial. Many of our young people were put to prison. And often on a Sunday while preaching, I, I could not just continue preaching because the shooting just at the end of the church was so loud by Israeli soldiers that I had to stop. So I came back with all of these answers just to discover that people in Bethlehem have different questions. So they were not asking the questions to those answers. And this is why, actually, I had to learn to listen to listen where people are. And although this is my home church, still it took me seven years, actually, to understand what are the needs of the people, uh, what matters to them, and how can you really preach the good news in a context where people woke up every day hoping for some good news, and all what they hear is bad news. And you don't want them to, you don't want to tell them, you know, just wait for eternity, it's going to be better. Because that's not really going to help. So it was these questions that I was struggling with. Um, and as I said, it took me seven years really to figure out, to understand where people are. And after that, we felt God calling us to reach out to the community. He was saying, you know, it's not enough to work within the walls of the church. Although often I feel, you know, our church members, not only in Palestine, I think in many places, they like just to be pampered, you know, uh, by the pastor. And they lose this uh, uh, feeling that, you know, we have to do outreach. At that time, Christmas Lutheran Church was a dying church too small to survive, like many churches maybe in rural areas here. Um, I did a study last year, and um, it was, I, I couldn't believe my eyes. Uh, in this study, I was able to show that 95% of, of, the, of the members of Christmas Lutheran Church left Palestine in the last 150 years. So only 5% stayed back, imagine. And so the fear was maybe these 5% who are left might leave as well because of the context. 
Um, and, but we felt this call, God was calling us to reach out, to leave the walls of the church and to go to the community. And, you know, when we casted this vision, I thought that, you know, the church will be happy, they will be thrilled to hear that we are starting now an outreach ministry. Not at all. They were saying, you know, this might weaken the church. It will drive the attention away from the ministry. This is not the core ministry of the church. We never did it this way. You know how it is. Because they like always to do things as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever, right? <laughs> and so at that time I felt, you know, sometimes God works through the church and sometimes God works in spite of the fact that there is a church out there. <laughs> but in this stage, actually, the most important thing I learned, actually, is if in ministry, if you want to be a pastor, but that's not only for pastors. I think also for students now going out uh, when they graduate into the world, listening is really important. Um, listening where people are and what people's needs are. But also li listening to the call of the Lord because the Lord might be calling us, calling us to do all different kinds of things that we never thought of. And that's the exciting thing. But also I learned sometimes as a pastor, you have to have the courage actually to lead, sometimes against the grain, to swim upstream, and to go against the current and tide. So this is the first station I thought I would like to, to share with you. Let me come to the second step. So in September 1995, we were able to start with this outreach ministry. Uh, at that time, you know, our church is a bit funny because it's located on the second floor. Uh, on the ground floor, uh, there were the crypt of the church, and this crypt uh, was abandoned for many, many years. Um, the church put all of the rubbish there, and even the neighborhood started doing all the rubbish there. And we thought, you know, this is where we would like to start the outreach ministry. Um, and with the young people of the church, with international volunteers from all over, we started renovating these rooms. Uh, we took 54 trucks of rubbish out of that building. And a hundred years old building, beautiful building, that was really abandoned, uh, uh, was transformed into one of the most beautiful community center. Uh, we hired the first um, uh, full-time employee, uh, a young Palestinian Christian woman. She just finished her master's degree at the University of Michigan in an arbor, came back, and we hired her immediately. Um, and we started doing training for young people and for women. These were the two most important target group for us. And we could see that the ministry started growing. 1998, we had already four full employees, full-time employees, and the promise at that time was in the air. You remember, you know, uh, we were hoping that 1999, there will be a Palestinian state, that peace between Israel and Palestine will finally come. Uh, Bethlehem was preparing for the millennium celebrations, you know, 2,000 years Christianity, and lots of projects. Uh, I mean, the whole of Bethlehem was just a construction site. Uh, over $200 million in projects were implemented. Um, and at that time, actually, the Finnish government thought that our project is worthwhile uh, uh, supporting, and so uh, they supported us to, to grow the infrastructure of the center, and so they, they supported a cultural and conference center that, that we still have. Um, our hope was to inaugurate that building 2001 and to be able to reach to more people. But in 2000, September 2000, so five years after we started, 
the Second Intifada started. I'm not sure if you remember the Second Intifada. This was much more violent. Um, the Palestinians were using guns. Uh, in the First Intifada, they were not using guns. In the Second Intifada, they started using guns. And I remember in my first sermon, I had to step and say, you know, using arms is really not the way. Because there is no military solution for the Middle East conflict. There is only a political solution. Anyhow, Sharon, the Israeli prime minister, was really dragging us into the conflict. He wanted the Palestinians to use uh, arms so that he can reinvade Bethlehem and, and the West Bank, which really he did. Um, and I still remember on April 2nd, 2002, uh, it was early morning hours, like five o'clock in the morning, we got a phone call saying that the Israeli troops had just entered Bethlehem with tanks. Um, and a few hours later, two Israeli tanks were just stationed outside of our center and outside of our home. Uh, we were stuck there, my wife, my two daughters, my mother, and uh, for, 13 years, uh, for 13 hours, the Israeli tanks were shelling. And we thought, actually, we are not going to survive. Uh, they blew up uh, the entrance to our home. Uh, they stormed our center, and uh, they used it as their, the Israeli, as their military headquarters for three days. And before leaving, actually, they left lots of destruction, over half a million dollars in destruction. I, I, I went to out on, my com, on the compound, because we live on compound. I, I went out to see what happened there uh, after three days. Um, and Israeli soldiers came, and they uh, actually detained me in my office. And we had a conversation, which I thought is interesting, because the one Israeli soldier was say, telling me, you know, this center is so beautiful. But he was, you know, sarcastic as if he wanted to say, you know, you don't deserve it. Why should you have something like this in Palestine? It doesn't belong here. I told him, you know, I mean, we Palestinians, we love beauty. And uh, we love culture, especially in this place. Um, and he, another Israeli soldier looked at me and said, you know, you sound like a wise man. Again, was sarcastic. And I, I remember telling him that a real wise person is the person who is capable of transforming his enemy to become a neighbor and not his neighbor to become an enemy. That is the wisdom that, that, that we, we, we need. Anyhow, we were for 12 days, I mean 40 days altogether, but the first 12 days under curfew 24-7. We couldn't leave. We didn't have even enough supplies in our home. And I still remember after 12 days, the first person to be allowed to come and visit us was the CNN reporter, uh, Ben Wiedemann. He was the uh, CNN correspondent for the Middle East. And uh, I was ill. I think it was just too much for me to see, you know, what, what, you, what you worked so hard for five years to build up was destroyed in 11 hours. Um, and so he came, um, I was in my pajama actually, uh, and you know, he said, you know, uh, Mitri, don't you get angry when you see what you have built was destroyed. I said, definitely, because even as pastors, we are human beings and we remain human beings. I know some churches would like to have uh, pastors who are non-human beings, but we are human beings, okay? <laughs> Uh, but I told him, you know, uh, what every time we get angry, we start a new project. He said, now I know why you are having all of these projects. You must be a very angry man. <laughs> but actually, I believe that's really very important in pastoring. Um, 
how can we help our people to transform the anger? Because anger is a, is, is a huge power that could be destructive, but if channeled in the right way, actually it could be something that is very helpful. If we just, you know, help people to transform this, this anger into something constructive. So it will not kill them, it will not kill the other, but really it will take them one step further. After 40 days, once Bethlehem was again, the, the curfew was lifted, uh, our staff came together. We were by then maybe 12, pe- 12 on staff. Um, and we looked at Bethlehem. Everything was around us was destroyed. You know, you look at the street, shattered glass everywhere. You know, uh, you look at, at, at the cars. They just destroyed the cars with the tanks. They just went over the cars with their tanks. Um, Bethlehem was so desperate. It was so hopeless. I mean, all of this momentum was was that was building before the year 2000 was suddenly actually destroyed. And we said, so what is our message in this time? And I remember one of our uh, staff uh, member, she came with uh, the idea, why not at our entrance that was blown up, why not put a huge black banner? And on this black banner, we will write, uh, destruction may be, continuity shall be. Basically, telling our people, we will not give up on our community. We will not give up on the little town of Bethlehem. We are here to stay. We will not go away. And we were already training women, as I said, in arts and crafts. And so we asked all of our students to go to the streets and to gather all of these pieces of shattered glass from the shelling and bombing. And they brought, I mean, it was a huge amount of of glass that they brought to our center. And they started actually doing out of these shattered pieces of glass angels uh, and crosses and butterflies. Really symbols of hope, but hope that comes out actually out of this situation of hopelessness. And we thought this is exactly our role as Christians, is to look for these shattered lives, uh, these broken uh, promises and and broken hopes, and to touch them in the uh, healing hand of Christ and to make something whole out of it. And these angels, uh, stained glass angels, started flying all over the world. I mean, people were ordering them from the States, from Norway, from South Africa, from everywhere, And these angels became actually angels telling our story, story of hope that actually is born in a place of hopelessness. And we thought, isn't this actually the story of Jesus? Jesus born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem at that time was occupied by the Romans. And yet he brought new life. And so the, the second lesson I learned, actually, is that uh, as a pastor, when everything seems to be falling apart, to trust that the Lord will lift you up so that you can restore others. That really was the powerful message I learned in this second stage of my life. Let me come to the third In 2003, so one year later, Israel started building the wall around Bethlehem. Uh, And more and more land was confiscated around Bethlehem to build more Jewish settlements in occupied territories, which is against international law. And it became clear that peace is not in reach. You know, until the year 2000, I felt that During my lifetime, I will be able to experience peace. But unfortunately, after 2003, I started doubting that. The little town of Bethlehem, if those of you who visited it will know it, is now surrounded from three sides by a 25-foot high wall, which is, I mean, it's almost as high as, you know, 
this auditorium. You will see it now in, in the film. Um, and the wall is built actually in the backyard of the last home in town, which really means our cities cannot expand anymore because they are surrounded now by Jewish settlements who have taken all of our land. 86% of the land of Bethlehem is under Israeli control, not under our control as Palestinians. And so how to be a pastor in such a context? Because if a city cannot expand, if, if we cannot open new businesses, new neighborhoods, a city will die. We cannot open new businesses, then the unemployment rate will rise. With rising unemployment, you will have more social problems. With more social problems, you will have more crime. With more crimes, you will have more drugs. I mean, it's a vicious circle, man-made. It's not something like a catastrophe coming from heaven, but it's something that actually the Israeli government is, is planning. And in this context was the question, so what is our role in this context? When Bethlehem is becoming this, this walled city, almost like a ghetto, when everything seems to become so ugly, it was at that time that we felt that again God was calling us to start a college, a Christian college. And I remember when I started sharing this vision with people around me, they said, you know, you are crazy. I mean, now in a context like this, you, will, you want to start another college? I said, you know, maybe you are crazy, but a crazy world like ours needs crazy people like us. Because <laughs> imagine if we will leave our world to the real crazy people. And, you know, we have many of them, I tell you. But the college became important because we didn't want our young people, the students, your age, uh, to believe one day that the wall is the limit. And that they are stuck and they don't have options. We want to instill in them, you know, that notion that the sky is the limit. And even in this very difficult situation, they can be peacemakers, not peace talkers. You know, we have lots of peace talkers. Uh, and I always say, you know, Jesus knew exactly how to choose his words by saying, blessed are the peacemakers, not the peace talkers, you know. We have had peace talks now for 22 years without anything. But the vision was, imagine if out of this college, all the future filmmaker and artists and designers and music, uh, musicians and uh, script writers, uh, theater uh, people will come out of this Christian college to transform the identity of a whole nation. A whole nation that is going through tough times. It's a tough cooling, but still in that situation to proclaim hope. Not hope in the sense that tomorrow is going to be better, but hope in the sense, let's do something about it. It's like when Martin Luther once said, even if I knew that the world is coming to an end tomorrow, he said, I will go out today into the garden and plant an olive tree. As a German, he spoke about the apple tree. Maybe you know it that way. But as Palestinians, we like to talk about the olive trees because apple trees, really, they don't uh, do well in, in Palestine. <laughs> um, and, okay, it's a great vision to have a Christian college. I mean, but we didn't have even the land for it. <laughs> All that I knew is that the church used to own a piece of land in the 19th century, which was confiscated by the English government because it was registered in the name of Germans, and Germans and British were in war in World War I. So what we did actually, we hired a very prominent uh, architect from Italy called Portuguese, very, very, uh, very well known. And we asked him to do for us, you know, a master plan of the whole mountain. And I still remember people around me said, you know, I mean, did you find like an oil well some, somewhere? I mean, <laughs> with this master plan, you know, this like, you know, hundred million dollar project, I mean, you are crazy, I mean. And 
I took these plans, went to Arafat, and said, you know, this is what we want to do, and we need our land back. With some arm twisting, <laughs> we were able to get at least six acres back of that land. And Arafat said, OK, on one condition, you have to prove that the first building will up and running in one year. Because many people wanted that piece of land. It's really prime land. All I, that I had was something like $50,000. But we invited him for the groundbreaking, and he came, and we broke ground in faith. No one really could see what, what will happen. But we broke ground in faith, and believe it or not, we have now four of the buildings already up and running, and we will start in this year, actually, with the fifth building, which is the library. And the university became, or the college became, a city on the hill. If you come to our college, you wouldn't believe it, 75% of our students are Muslims. Only 25% are Christians. And 54% are female. And looking at our young people, uh, this year, two of our filmmakers, uh, uh, students, they won so many awards. One of them won actually 17 awards in one year. He's 21 years old, come from a remote village. He was never in, outside of Palestine. And suddenly, you know, he, f he won the first documentary, short documentary award in Abu Dhabi. Uh, was for the first time invited to come out of Palestine, to fly to Abu Dhabi, to walk on the red carpet. I mean, just, you know, just to see what kind of transformation is this doing to the young people that are going through a tough time. But, you know, um, we give them just the skills to keep reaching to the stars. So, being a pastor meant to me that casting a, a bold vision uh, is important. Uh, as pastors, but I think even as Christians, we cannot just cast visions that we can move. That's easy. But we should leave some room for the Lord to act. Because otherwise, that is not a vision. And so pastoring, in that sense, meant to me to be ready to move mountains. And indeed, this is a mountain that we moved. So leaving room for God in our plans is the lesson that I learned in this third station. Let me come to the fourth and last point. In January 2012, I got a phone call from someone in Germany I didn't know. He said, you know, you are nominated to the German Media Prize. And I would like to ask you a few questions. He did, and I tried answering his questions. And a few days later, I received an email that I was selected for this prestigious award together with three other people. I had no idea what the German media prize was, so I went to Google uh, and looked it up. And I have to say, I mean, I couldn't believe my eyes because the list of our these, you know, included like Nelson Mandela, Dalai Lama, Bill Clinton, King Hussein, Angela Merkel, but also celebrities like Bono, George Clooney. Uh. <laughs> Anyhow, um, and I asked myself, you know, how did I deserve this? And as a pastor, I know, you know, we never deserve anything because it's all grace, grace, grace alone. So I was really thrilled, you know, to be nominated and to receive this award and was looking for, forward for the ceremony, which was scheduled like a month later. But suddenly, before the award, 
I felt like hell broke out. In the Jerusalem Post, this is one of the right-wing Israeli newspaper, they published a full page against me. And another German journalist published something in German. A German Lutheran pastor residing in Jerusalem published a third article against me. Her husband, an English theologian, wrote a further article. And I felt, you know, I mean, really the hell broke out. So you have all of this joy, but suddenly, you know, you have all of these fears. And the aim of all of these articles was what I call character assassination. Interestingly enough, most of these attacks, believe it or not, came from Christian Zionists. Some from Israeli, Jewish Israeli, but really the majority from Christian Zionists because they want to believe that the Israeli occupation of Palestine is by divine planning. And if I actually raise my voice against the Israeli occupation, against the oppression of my people, I'm standing God in the way. For them, violating the human rights in the name of divine rights, it's okay. For me, it's not okay, because actually this leads only to one thing, which is ISIS. This is what ISIS is doing all the time, violating human rights in the name of divine rights. And we know actually as Christians that since the incarnation, we cannot play God against the human. <laughs> we cannot violate human rights in the name of divine rights. Anyhow, it was, again, a very tough time. Um, and... You know, even some pastors from the States send me death threats uh, over the email. Um, during the ceremony, um, they have to have bodyguards to protect me and my family uh, because the Israel lobby in Germany uh, wanted to storm. They threatened to storm that ceremony. What I learned, actually, is that as pastor, you have to be ready to speak truth to power even if it comes with a high price tag. And during this experience, actually, I started understanding Paul when he speaks that our struggle is not with flesh and blood, but with the principalities of this world. Paul was not deterred, nor shall we. Let me end uh, by saying, being a pastor in Bethlehem, meant to embark on an exciting journey with immense challenges, but with endless opportunities. There were moments of fears, but also there were moments of joy. Maybe you know that one of my favorite uh, hymns, The O Little Town of Bethlehem. <laughs> I'm not neutral on that, you know, but, <laughs> but it says the hopes and fears of all the years. This is exactly what's still going on in Bethlehem. I mean, lots of fears, but immense hope. What I learned in this journey is that we need to keep learning, developing theologies, reflecting on new ways of doing ministry. And I tell you, life in Palestine is never boring, as you heard. <laughs> what keeps us going is knowing that God is faithful, and that we are never alone. What keeps us going are the prayers of so many people around the globe that keep us in their prayers. But what keeps us going are also the smiles on the faces of the youth and students that we are serving. I started my ministry 30 years ago there were and still are very tough moments where we weren't sure if we were to survive. But there are also many moments of joys that I wouldn't like to miss in my life. After 30 years of being pastor in Bethlehem, I have to say I never ever regretted being a pastor. It is an honor to be called to serve. 
A friend of mine, one of our board members, a very successful Palestinian businessman, he loves always to say, Palestine is not for the faint-hearted. <laughs> it's not. And he always liked to say, diamonds are made under pressure. If I were to find a statement that would summarize my experience as pastor in Bethlehem, I cannot find better words than those of Paul. Hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Within these 30 years, this ministry in Bethlehem that started so small developed to become the third largest private employer in the Bethlehem region. If you would have told me 30 years ago that we will be today where we are, I would have laughed like Sarah when she was told she's getting pregnant with 90. <laughs> but pastoring means always to leave room for God to do through us and sometimes in spite of us, the impossible. So just to give you an idea about the ministry, to give it some flesh and blood, we will see a short video and then we will continue. DR is nothing but uh, a success story from Palestine. Uh, I still remember how we started back in 1995, uh, very small, uh, with eight chairs from the 50s, one desk from the 60s, an old typewriter, and how this organization actually developed to be and to become the third largest private employer in the Bethlehem region. Our work took place in the most difficult context the context of the Israeli occupation of the West Bank, one of the longest ongoing occupation in modern history. Even in this very difficult situation, we wanted to create facts on the ground. We weren't satisfied just with counting the human rights violations that are taking place in the West Bank, but we really uh, wanted to invest in Palestine and to invest in infrastructure. And so in the last 18 years, we were able to construct a new university college with a new campus, to construct a, a cultural and conference center, a state-of-the-art building. So investing in Palestine became really a major aspect of this ministry. But our biggest investment was in people. It's the young people of Palestine that we wanted to empower them to assume leadership role, uh, to assume responsibility, and to take this uh, vision to new heights. In the context of hopelessness and despair, our role was to create room for hope. And so everything you see around us uh, really is just to provide our people with room where they can experience hope and be part of that hopeful story. What makes DR special are actually the programs. The programs that reach out to the people of Palestine from womb to tomb, with an emphasis really on the young people, on the youth, on women, and on the elderly. This is really, I think, the most fascinating story that comes out of DR. Our programs are meant to be for the long term. Uh, we don't work on short-term projects, and we are not donor-driven. We don't do this because there are funds for it, but we do them only because we believe they are part of a larger story, and they are part of a larger vision, and part of a larger strategy. In our program, we focus on culture, Many people ask, why culture? I believe that in the Middle East, we have too much politics. People get politics for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner. On the other hand, 
I believe we have too much religion. There is no faith, faith in oneself, in one's ability. Uh, and the region, I feel, is losing its soul. And for me, culture is like the art to breathe. It's when everything is falling apart. Culture is the attempt to try to restore the soul uh, and to restore the person and to restore the community and to make it whole. Part of our mission is to document our oral history, to gather the stories of our community and of our people, and to help develop a Palestinian narrative that has been pushed aside, that was silenced for a long time, and to help our people articulate that narrative, who they are and who they want to be, and to help create that narrative that shaped Palestinian identity. In 1995, we started as a local Bethlehem organization, very small. And within the first 10 years, we developed to be a national organization with program running in many different cities and towns and villages and refugee camps on the West Bank. And in the last six years, we became a regional organization uh, we have projects focusing on Middle Eastern issues in Egypt, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Jordan, and in Palestine, bringing the people of the Middle East together to draw a new vision for their future. And now we have many international programs, international conferences that take place here in Bethlehem, Palestinian art festivals that take place in Europe and the United States, and uh, DR is truly now an international organization. Our mission is to help our people survive and thrive. Survival is not enough for us, but we want our community to thrive in spite of all the difficulties that they are facing because they deserve to have life, they deserve to have a future, and to have life in abundance. Bethlehem is the place where the human met the divine and where the world became flesh. This is why we understand our mission to offer a space where people from different cultures and backgrounds can meet and see each other as fellow human beings, as, as brothers and sisters, and to see the image of God in the other. So I think you saw being pastor in Bethlehem is a unique calling, but it's a tough calling. Thank you very much. We have some time for questions. So if you have a question on a card, feel free to hold that up. They'll be collected and brought to the front. Um, I'll get started with a couple questions. A question uh, they got both by email and on Twitter uh, having to do with um, the U.S. relationship to Palestine and what kind of support or lack of support are you getting from the U.S.? And then also, how can U.S. citizens advocate for the rights of Palestinian Christians? Yeah, um, it's a very good question. Um, because, um, you know, I think the, the American people that I meet all the time um, who come to visit us in Palestine, but also I meet that I meet here, I think they really understand our plight. Uh, the problem is that uh, in this country you have a very powerful Israel lobby and that most of the people in Congress, they are not standing up for the American values that we all believe in, that are human values, that are Christian values, but they are more interested to be re-elected 
than anything else. And I think this is where really it screws everything. And I think we need really to change that. And I think we change that by encouraging churches and, and people to have the courage to speak up, uh, to tell their Congress that they really care about the little town of Bethlehem. Because I know many people here, they really do care. But I, I think as Christians, we were not maybe involved politically enough in this. Uh, in this, uh, in this uh. But thanks God, I have to say, things are changing. I mean, I still remember when I came to this country 25 years ago, no one knew anything about Palestine. Now it's totally different. I mean, PCUSA took, uh, decision to divest, you know, UCC took a decision to divest. I mean, so there are, I mean, we came a long way, and uh, I think we need to continue uh, on that road. A uh, question from a student wondering if you can talk a little bit about the Israelis and do some of the Israelis um, oppose the occupation? Yeah, in fact, uh, this award that I will receive after tomorrow in, in, in Stockholm. Uh, I will receive with uh, an Israeli Jewish journalist. His name is Gideon Levy. Uh, he is one of the most articulated uh, Jewish Israeli uh, 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 journalists. And I was uh, telling the students this morning, uh, they asked me, you know, if we want some good news where to go to. I told them, you know, go to like Haaretz, an Israeli Jewish newspaper, because what they publish there can never be published in this country. <laughs> it's really interesting. And so uh, somebody like Gideon Levy, but also in this country, I mean, uh, thinking of Jewish Voices for Peace and others, I mean, there are, there is also within the Jewish community a growing uh, group of people who say, not in our name. A uh, question received by email here. What impact does the 75% Muslim, 25% Christian ratio have on the university? And what stories can you share about Christian and Muslim students working and studying together? Yeah, um, uh, it, it's really interesting. I mean, uh, uh, let me maybe share just this one story since I, I see we have only three minutes left. Um, it's a story of uh, Rafat. Rafat was the only... A Bedouin students that came to our university. You know, we don't have many Bedouins in Palestine, but this young Bedouin man, he's, he thought he's a great, uh, in great in painting, so he wanted to come and study uh, contemporary art. And he came and finished uh, uh, his degree with us, and his, uh, uh, his uh, final project was amazing. Uh, because he had three paintings. They were like very dark, but they were like uh, circles, uh, red, orange circles, in the two uh, that are left and right. Um, and in the middle, there were like only two uh, circles. They were much bigger. And other than that, it was a dark painting. And then he had a lamp, oil lamp, in the middle of the room. It was an installation art that he did. A, a oil lamp in the middle, and then he brought uh, like a spotlight going through that lamp to the middle painting. And you know, he was explaining what, what his project is, and he said, you know, uh, I call this the city on the hill. And he had Matthew 5 there. And he said, you know, when I sit uh, in the desert, I look at Bethlehem, these, these circles is is the city on the hill that I see at night. These are the lights. So we said, what about the two bigger lights in the middle? He said, you know, every now and then, a car gets lost in the desert. That's the car. But that's not the car. This is me, because I felt before coming to this college, I was lost. But now I'm found. I thought, you know, I mean, what more, what, what more do we want? I mean, uh, if somebody can say that, I think this Christian college is doing its job. Let's thank God for the hand.